Good morning, it's Russ Barkley here with your weekend research roundup. This weekend we've got four articles to talk about, uh, but before I do, I want to open up with some jokes about ADHD from people with ADHD. This was suggested by one of the subscribers, and I thought it might be a nice change of pace from the increasingly awful dad jokes that I've been using lately. And for this, we're going to go over to the YouTube channel for Jessica McCabe. This is How to ADHD. That's the name of the channel. And on it, Jessica was listening to some ADHD jokes that were being read to her by her husband. However, if you look down at the commentary section, there are some pretty good jokes listed in here from people who chose to write a reply to Jessica's video. By the way, I really do like Jessica's website. I think it is a wonderful way of getting the science about ADHD out to individuals using a very practical, often humorous, sometimes musical approach to conveying the information. So um, if you're looking for a channel other than mine to have a look at, I think Jessica does a nice job at getting advice and recommendations out to people with ADHD. Okay, so here we are. Here are some of your ADHD jokes for this morning. First one up, based on a true story, what happens when three ADHD people agree to tidy a house? The garden looks lovely. I thought that was pretty good. Okay, I met with two ADHD friends to study for exams. We had a really productive day. We rearranged my friend's apartment and we bought a couch. <laughs> and a third one up for you here is, someone says, please give me your full attention. And the person with ADHD says, I can't even get my own full attention. What are you talking about? So, okay, last one up, and then we're going to move on here. How many kids with ADHD does it take to change a light bulb? We never found out. We lost the light bulb and then ended up at the movies looking for it. Yes, of course we did. So my thanks to uh, Jessica's website and those who wrote replies. Those are some pretty awesome jokes, I think, anyway. So, all right, moving right along, the first article I want to talk about, I actually discussed over a month ago on June 28th in my Saturday Research Review. This was a very large study using the population database from Sweden and nearly a quarter million individuals with ADHD who had been using medication. Now, the beauty of this study is, first of all, it involves a very large sample that always helps in determining that the findings we're going to see are probably robust and will likely be replicated. Second, it uses a cross-section of the Swedish population of people with ADHD and medication, so that's unlikely to have the kind of biases that we see when we focus on studies from, say, a single clinic using a smaller sample. But most importantly, this study compares the individuals who were on medication and then to the same individual during periods of time they weren't using medication. So it's using the person as their own control, which is a very important, I think, uh, methodology when one is trying to establish what these medications might be doing. Usually we compare people who took the medication to people who didn't take the medication. Uh, in this case, we're comparing the person to themselves over time on and off medication. And I think the study, of course, as I mentioned earlier, was significant because it looks at real world outcomes. And what did they find? Well, as you know, from June 28th, I told you that they reported that rates of self-harm, rates of unintentional injury, traffic crashes, and even crime rates were all significantly decreased during periods of time when individuals were taking medication than when the same individuals were not taking medication. They did compare three different time periods. And this is why I want to come back and talk about the study just a little bit, because somebody wrote to me and said, what do you think of the finding when they compared these three time periods over time? During those time periods, rates of medication quadrupled. So in the first time period, rates of medication was about six tenths of 1% of the population. By the time we get to the end of the study period they're looking at 2016 to 2020, the rate of medication was 2.8% 
in Sweden. So there's an increase in population, or excuse me, in the number of people taking medication over these three time periods. Now, what the study found, and I didn't mention this, or if I did, I didn't make much of it, is that over time, the effect of the medication on the real world outcomes decreased. Meaning, by the time we get to the 2.8% prevalence figure, they're not detecting as much effects of medication on these outcomes as they did in earlier outcomes. They still de detected some. I believe it had to do with rates of self-harm. But uh, And also, I think, let's see here, with... Um, hanging on here, uh, was, well, in any case, uh, rates of self-harm for sure. So what do we make of this idea that there is a decreasing effect of medication on these outcomes over these periods of time? Uh, and here's what I make of it. When we start medicating individuals, let's say in the first time period, we're medicating the most severe individuals. They have more severe ADHD. Now, as medication rates increase, we're capturing more and more of the ADHD population coming into clinics, and particularly we're likely to be capturing people with somewhat lower levels of severity and of comorbidity than we did initially. So, and you know that the more severe the ADHD is, the more likely they are to have these real world outcomes that I've mentioned. So it makes sense that as we increase the rate of medication use in the population, we're picking up less and less severe ADHD, less and less comorbidity, less and less impairment, and therefore there's less effect for the medication to have, to detect on these outcomes. So that's my take on this. I'm sure that there are several other ways of interpreting the results, but it does not mean that the medication isn't working over time, it is, but it simply means that there's probably changes in the nature of the groups that are receiving the medication as we increase rates of prescribing. Okay, so enough about that study. I want to move on to the st three studies that are new for this week, two of which have to do with neuroimaging using functional MRI. Now, the first one is a study of ADHD individuals, and they're going to be looking at both structural connectivity between different brain regions, and they're also going to look at regional gray matter connectivity within regions, and also looking at the gray matter of the brain, not just the axons that project and connect up these various brain structures. And what did the study find? Well, first of all, the study found that ADHD individuals showed aberrant structural connectivity, most likely related to disrupted axon connections that are being projected across the brain. They also found that the individuals with ADHD had less regional connectivity of their gray matter. Uh, I think that's very important to point out as well because we know from earlier studies that there is reduced gray matter volume, at least in children who have ADHD. This appears to normalize over time but at least it's there in children. This may be one reason for those earlier findings. The study uh, authors believe that this reflects difficulties with the structural or long-range projections and pathways in the brain of nerve cells as they develop. They're not projecting as well as normally as others do, and certainly once they finish their projection across the brain, then the regional gray matter connectivity is poorer, is reduced. So I think very important for our understanding of what is going on in the brain that is leading to ADHD difficulties. This study came to us, by the way, from the journal NeuroImage. Now, our next study also involves looking at functional MRI networks and connectivity, this one, however, is going to concentrate on individuals who are getting psychostimulants and healthy controls. But we're going to take the ADHD group getting the stimulants and the authors split them into those that have a relative with bipolar disorder, so they're high risk for bipolar, and those who do not have such a relative, which they classify as low risk. 
there's also a placebo group here. The authors are looking at the drug amphetamines, not methylphenidate, but amphetamines in these individuals. And what do they find? They found that when they looked at the 135 youth that they were studying, 45 of whom were healthy controls, the others were those with ADHD divided up into three groups I've just, just mentioned. It says here that what they found was that there were significant differences over time in the regional connectivity, that is the functional connectivity of different brain regions. And they found that after 12 weeks of medication treatment, at least in the low risk group, that is the ADHD group that didn't have a high risk of bipolar disorder, the initial baseline differences in connectivity were normalized compared to the healthy control group. I have been talking about this repeatedly on this channel about the effect of medication on normalizing brain development in some individuals who take medication. Doesn't happen in everyone, but it does happen. The word for this is neuroprotection, and you can go back and look for my other videos on neuroprotection. So they did find, however, that in the group that had higher risk for bipolar disorder, that over time, there was a decrease in the efficiency of connections to the amygdala. Now, this might make sense in trying to understand bipolar disorder, which we believe is a problem with activation of the limbic system, the amygdala specifically, but the limbic system or emotional brain more generally, and that there is less of an influence of the executive frontal lobe that is the self-regulation part of the brain on the limbic system and on the amygdala. This appears to show that those who have a higher risk for bipolar disorder may have more difficulties in these connections into the emotional brain, the amygdala. So very important finding there, once again, demonstrating, I think this is the 35th study showing this, that taking medication over time may help to normalize brain functioning. And we've certainly seen data that shows that there's an increase in brain growth in regions related to ADHD. Again, not in everyone, but in a significant minority of individuals. That article, by the way, came to us from the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. My final article, you may wonder why I'm even talking about it at all, it's a study of placebo responses in kids with ADHD who were in the multimodal treatment study that was done decades ago. This at the time was the largest and among the most important studies of treatment for ADHD, and we had groups that were getting medication, groups that were getting the psychosocial treatment component, which was very extensive and intensive. And we had a group that was assigned to a community control group treatment as usual. Now, during the study design itself, initially, they had groups of individuals who were assigned to placebo, not to medication, and they looked at the degree of improvement in these individuals on the placebo pill using both parent and teacher ratings of ADHD symptoms. By the way, they also had kind of a placebo group for their psychosocial treatment study. It was a non-medical control condition, mainly involved, I think, just giving information to families. Nonetheless, what this study reports is that there was a significant effect of the placebo pill from baseline out to 12 weeks for parents and up to eight weeks for teacher ratings. And that these were, as I've said, not only statistically significant, they're pretty substantial. We're looking here at over a half a standard deviation of improvement in these ratings. Now, why would I focus on this? For a couple of reasons. First of all, it shows you why you have to use placebo control conditions when you are evaluating active treatments, in this case, active medication or active psychosocial treatments. The second thing it shows is that there is a significant placebo effect. 
So that if someone does a study where they don't use a control condition like a placebo condition, and they're simply measuring the people that they're treating before they do the treatment and after they do the treatment, that really doesn't mean anything because we don't know how much of any improvement they're reporting is actually due to the treatment and how much of it is actually due to a placebo effect. And as this study shows, those placebo effects can be pretty sizable, which is why we need to use placebo conditions. Now, another reason that this is very important, in my opinion, is that it explains why scientists need to give these rating scales once, then give them again, and then start the intervention study because there are practice effects on these rating scales. There's improvement on the rating scales even when there's no placebo being given. And although this study doesn't talk much about that, that is certainly the case with these rating scales. And we want to get rid of those practice effects besides controlling for these placebo effects when we do treatment studies. Now, the authors went on to compare the results of the four treatment groups in the MTA to the placebo group, the pill placebo group. And what they found when they did that is that only the medication management group and the group that got both medication and psychosocial treatment had significant improvements in their symptoms relative to that placebo group. On the other hand, the community control group and the group that got only the intensive behavioral intervention did not differ significantly from, from that placebo group. So even though the initial studies that were published on the MTA reported some improvement in those getting just psychosocial treatment, this study shows that those improvements were not any greater than what we see with placebo pills. So uh, I think very important points there that might have been very boring to you, but to someone doing research or someone who's evaluating research the way I do, you need to understand these placebo effects and these practice effects and why we have to control for them before we can render opinions about various treatments like neurofeedback, like ginkgo biloba, like uh, St. John's wort, like the omega-3-6s and the other things that people test often without using placebos. Now you see why those placebos are very important. Okay, thanks for joining me this morning for this research roundup. I hope you appreciated the ADHD jokes in place of the dad jokes. Again, my thanks to Jessica's website and the people who replied on that website for those jokes. I'll see you again in another week or so with another research update. I might be a little late on the next one because I'm going to be taking a road trip up to upstate New York but hopefully I will be able to get you the research review a few days after my return next Monday. Okay, that's not this Monday, next Monday. So, you know, look for the research review, but I'm going to be a little late. All right, everybody, thanks for joining me this morning. And as always, live well, be well, take care, and bye for now.